Hi, and welcome to the New York City Category Theory Seminar. This is February, 26th, February 16th. Okay, Emilio Minicciello is speaking. I didn't pronounce it right. You'll tell us how to pronounce it no, right. That's good. Okay, <laughs> that's good. good. Um, category theory in the, um, and differential geometry, intersection of category theory and differential geometry. Emilio, we have a little um, tradition around here. You have to tell us where you were born, where you did your undergraduate degree, where you did your, your well, where you're doing your, your graduate degree, and where you live now. Okay. So okay. take it away. All right. So uh, I was born in New York. Um, I did my undergraduate at Queens College, CUNY, um, and now I'm doing my PhD at the CUNY Graduate Center. Um, and I live in Astoria. Perfect. Go for it. All right. So, yeah, I'm going to talk about um, category theory in differential geometry. Um, and this is going to be a pretty uh, informal introductory talk. Um, I figured rather than talking about my research, it would probably be more fruitful uh, for people to just kind of get an introduction to the, the area of my research. Um, okay, Thank so you. please feel free to ask questions. Um, and I have a lot of slides also. So if people need to leave, like just, I won't, I won't be offended. Um, okay. And we're allowed to ask any stupid questions. We, yes, please. Okay, good. The stupider the question, the better. <laughs> we like stupid questions. Go. Yes. Okay. So yeah, so I'm just gonna, so I'm assuming people here know category theory, but don't know differential geometry. So I'm going to start with a lightning fast introduction to what is differential geometry. So the main object of study in differential geometry are uh, finite dimensional smooth manifolds. So these are nice topological spaces M uh, that locally look like RN. So they're equipped with an open cover and homeomorphisms to Rn. And on double intersections, uh, these maps called the transition functions are smooth. So here I have uij is the intersection of ui and uj. So to study an n-dimensional smooth manifold, differential geometers use tangent spaces to find at every point. And uh, the way you think about this is at a point, you have all these curves going through the point and you take a, a certain kind of equivalence class of these curves. Um, and those should represent little arrows sticking out at this point. And that forms a vector space at every point. So that's what Tx of m is. It's the tangent space of m at the point x. It's an n-dimensional real vector space. So these tangent spaces all wrapped up together to form a two n-dimensional smooth manifold called the tangent bundle. It's equipped with a projection map. So sections of this map, maps from M to TM, such that the composition is the identity one way, uh, are exactly vector fields. So for every point of M, I'm picking out a vector at that point. Um, so studying vector fields on manifolds tells you a lot about the smooth manifold. Uh, for example, not all smooth manifolds have everywhere zero non-zero vector fields. So famous Harry Ball theorem says the sphere does not have any everywhere non-zero vector fields. And some of you might have seen this incredible uh, picture uh, in some textbook or whatever about trying to comb the hair on a, on a sphere or a spherical dog. There's always going to be a cowlick somewhere. Um, so studying vector fields on smooth manifolds directly is a there, 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 There's a better way. It says that um, everywhere on earth, um, the wind is blowing. Exactly, yes, exactly. Um, so studying vector fields uh, directly is difficult. If you have a smooth map of manifolds, uh, you know, this doesn't give a functor because you can't generally push forward a vector field. Um, so instead we study uh, linear maps. So this is the exterior algebra on uh, vector fields here. If you don't know what that is, that's fine. Um, you have linear maps from this to R, and we call these differential K forms. And we can always pull these back along smooth maps. So this is functorial. Um, we denote the set, or really the DGA, uh, of all differential forms like this. Um, so this is a cochain complex. So we can take its cohomology and we call that Duram cohomology. 
And the Duram theorem says that uh, for smooth manifolds, this cohomology agrees with real uh, singular cohomology. So smooth structure, tangent information provides information about the topology of a smooth manifold and uh, vice versa. So that's a super, super quick introduction to differential geometry. Um, okay. So those are the basic tools, basic ingredients. Um, but these can only be used on finite dimensional smooth manifolds classically. Um, but there are a ton of spaces that show up all over geometry that aren't finite dimensional smooth manifolds. So here's a really simple one. Consider uh, the space axes uh, defined as a subspace of R2. So it's just these axes here, the X and Y axes. So this is not a finite dimensional smooth manifold. If you look in a neighborhood of zero here, um, this thing is supposed to be homeomorphic to some RN. Um, but if I took this point out, then I would have four components here. Um, and that, that can't happen when you're homeomorphic to, to an RN. Um, so that shows it's not a smooth manifold. So what's interesting though about the space is it can be written as a push out. So you take you know, two copies of R and you glue them together at this point zero here. Um, but this shows that the category of finite dimensional smooth manifolds does not have all pushouts. Um, in fact, man has very few co-limits and very few limits. And overall, man is a pretty ca crappy category. Um, so often differential geometers deal with spaces uh, that aren't finite dimensional smooth manifolds in ad hoc ways. Uh, and this is where category theory can help us. We wanna get away from ad hoc constructions and start building frameworks where we can deal with these spaces. Um, so the first problem where category theory can help us is uh, to extend classical constructions of differential geometry, such as tangent spaces, Duram cohomology, stuff like that to more spaces. Uh, for us category theorists, we would say, we wanna find a, a really good category maybe by complete Cartesian closed category, uh, such that there's a fully faithful embedding from manifolds into this category, and such that the classical constructions can be extended in some way, um, such that you know, they, they agree on the, on the manifolds, and then they also extend to the, to the whole category C. So here's a possible solution to the problem. Uh, the sheets on category manifold. Um, so, Maybe you don't know what sheaves are. So if you have a topological space X, uh, let O of X uh, denote the post set of open subsets. So if I could write, I would write, you know, uh, an object in this category is, is, you know, some U and then you have uh, morphisms or inclusions into other open subsets. Um, so this is a category um, and a pre-sheaf on this category associates to every open subset a, a set, f of u, to every inclusion uh, function of sets. And we denote it like that. Um, so if you label the open sets as uis, um, a matching family for a pre-sheaf uh, is a collection of elements for every ui, such that on every double intersection, uh, when you restrict them, they agree on double intersections. And then an amalgamation for this matching family is an element uh, on, the, on the set of the whole space, such that when I restrict every UI, I get this matching family. So then a sheaf on a topological space is a pre-sheaf such that every matching family, uh, for every matching family, there exists a unique amalgamation. So uh, some examples, if you have a topological space, you can define a pre-sheaf uh, here. So this assigns to every open set, the set of continuous real valued functions from U to R. So this is a sheaf because if there's a continuous function FI defined on each UI and they agree on double intersections, then I can just extend this to a single unique function on the whole topological space um, just by defining it to be FI for points that are in UI and then since uh, on double intersections, they agree, uh, it makes sense. So uh, this is a sheaf. And then uh, the pre-sheaf of bounded continuous functions 
the R is not a sheaf in general. So if you have the real line, um, you can have it be bounded on you know these open subsets on some open cover, but uh, then that function could um, not be bounded on all of R. So this is the, the classical definition of a sheaf. Um, however, we can extend this definition to more general categories than these OXs. Uh, all we need is a notion of covering of an object. So a site, I'm not going to actually give the full definition, but you can think of it as a small category such that for every object, I, I know what it means to cover a space. I know what it means to have a collection of maps um, and to know when a collection of maps is a covering for that object. Um, so the category man can be given a site structure. If I have a manifold, uh, then we say collection of maps is a covering if and only if each map is an inclusion of an open up subset and uh, this map is surjective. So in other words, this is a, a, an open covering of the manifold, okay? And then cart is gonna be the full subcategory whose objects are diffeomorphic to some RN. We're gonna call those Cartesian spaces. And this also has the same uh, kind of site structure. So um, if you have a site, uh, a pre-sheaf is a sheaf. If for every object, every covering, and every matching family, there exists a unique amalgamation. Um, so if C has pullbacks, then uh, being a sheaf is equivalent to saying that for every M, every covering, this, this diagram is an equalizer. So you might've seen this in some books. Um, and when C is the open subsets on some topological space, then this pullback here is actually just the intersection. And this recovers what I said before. So the NLAP has a really nice uh, interpretation of sheaves over a site. We think of objects of C as test spaces and sheaves are then generalized spaces, which we can probe with these test spaces. So I'm gonna read this uh, quote from the NLAB. Um, Let's now call the space, which I dreamed up X the generic symbol for spaces. For every space U that you come up with, I do some secret computation and then present you with a result. I hand you a set. Let's call it X of U and tell you that this is a set of ways that U can be mapped into X. So X of U is the probes of X by U. So when C is cart, we can think of sheaves as being these, these mysterious spaces that I can probe with RNs. So every smooth manifold is canonically a sheaf by the UNEDA embedding. Um, the pre-sheaf of differential K forms is a sheaf for every K. Um, in fact, a differential form on a manifold, so a single differential form here, um, is precisely the same thing as a map of sheaves like this by the UNEDA embedding, by the UNEDA lemma. sorry. Yeah. One second. One, one comment, it's not UNEDA if it's on cart, but... But it's, it's oh, sorry. Yeah, no, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, on card, it's not the unit. <laughs> on man, it's the unit embedding. Exactly. Uh, yeah, sorry. I, I, I haven't been looking at the con at the chat. Um, uh, what, 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 uh, Gary should ask, what is the name given to the category man or cart viewed as a site or for the category of sheaves on it? I.e., what is the name of the associated growth and topology? What is the name? In, a, uh, in other words, what is the name of the associated growth and deep topology? I, I don't, I don't, I'm not sure I understand the question. What is the no, name I'm of going the growth from and deep topology? To sheaves. Does it have a different uh, thing? Oh yeah, okay. I guess I'm asking if this is just sort of like, you know, the, the category of right pre sheaves with like the freest possible uh, topology, or if this is like a specific more risk more, I guess, restrictive or not, or less restrictive depending on how you look at it, Wharton deep topology that you're placing on man and cart. Um, I'm not sure if I understand the question. Um, this is just, uh, this is one possible growth in deep topology you could put on the category of, you know, smooth manifolds or on cart. Uh, right. And I guess I was just asking, yes, you've described one. And th does this mm -hmm. one have a particular name compared to other ones? Like, oh, um, yeah, I'm, I'm not, I don't really know. Um, <laughs> maybe, uh, yeah, I've, no, I've never seen some, but maybe the good open cover, like open cover growth and deep topology or something like that. Um, 
open cover topology. Yeah. David Roberts probably know more about the <laughs> naming of stuff like this. Um, yeah. Um, okay. Um, any other questions? Yeah, we're good. Go, go. Okay. Um, so the first example uh, shows that we have a fully faithful embedding um, from man into sheaves and cart. This is not Dionita embedding. Thank you for saying that. Um, but sheaves on cart is a topos. That means it is bi complete and Cartesian closed, um, which is great as a category. Um, so given any diagram of smooth manifolds, we can think of them as sheaves and take respective limits or co-limits in this category. Um, these will always exist in sheaves. We can also take mapping spaces. So given any two smooth manifolds, define a sheaf as follows. Um, this is an example of internal HOM on this category. Um, so it might have seemed like we've declared victory. The space axes certainly belongs to sheaves on cart, but don't forget we also want to extend classical constructions to this whole category. Um, there's a full subcategory of sheaves that sacrifices a tiny bit of categorical convenience for a whole lot of geometric intuition. Uh, we call these objects concrete sheaves. So a sheaf on cart is concrete if the following map is injective. So we have uh, X of U is a subset of, I take U and I think of it just as a set, and I have set functions from U as a set into X evaluated on a point. So X of U needs to be a subset of maps from the underlying sets, basically, where we can think of X on a point as its underlying set of this sheaf. Okay, so every smooth manifold is a concrete sheaf because every smooth map is in particular a set function. But uh, omega of K is not a concrete sheaf because omega k of u is not a subset of this because omega k on a point is just trivial vector space. Um, so set functions are uh, just singleton. Um, so we can think of concrete sheaves as sheaves where we have a good notion of underlying set, where we're evaluating our sheaf on a, on a point. But there's another equivalent way of thinking about concrete sheaves on cart. So um, definition, let X be a set. A parameterization is a set function from a Cartesian space to X. A diffeology on X is then a collection of parameterizations that satisfy some conditions. Um, so maybe I won't say exactly what the conditions are, um, but it, um, this should tell you um, we should think of a diffeology on a set as a way of choosing which set functions we wish to consider smooth. Um, so a set X, I'm sorry. Uh, you're going pretty fast. I, I think you have time. Oh, I'm sorry. Tell us, no, just in terms of, I think you have time to tell us a little more about the conditions. like and how Sure, sure, work. okay. Um, right, so what's a diffeology on a set? Well, it's a certain kind of set functions. And I wanna think of these set functions as, as smooth maps. Um, kind of like a topology tells you what subsets are, are the open subsets. Um, okay, so what kind of set functions, what conditions do I need? Well, first of all, I want all constant maps to belong to the diffeology. Um, so I map all of U to a, a single point in X. Um, if I have uh, this map in my diffeology and I have a smooth function of uh, Cartesian spaces, then I want the comp the composite to also belong to my diffeology. Uh, and finally, if I have a parameterization and I have a, a covering of my, um, of my Cartesian space, um, such that the restriction on every UI belongs to my diffeology, then I want the original parameterization to belong to my diffeology. So these are uh, these three conditions, any a uh, set of maps that satisfies these three conditions can be called a diffeology on X. So a set with a diffeology is called a diffeological space in a, uh, analogy to topological spaces. So a parameterization that belongs to the diffeology is called a plot. 
So we think of these as, as probing our space, smooth probes of our space. Who, who, who's the first person to make these definitions? D so are you. So I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk a little bit about the history. Okay. Um, so smooth map of diffeological spaces is then a set function, underlying sets, such that if I have a plot in my diffeology, then the composite is also a plot of Y. So it's very nice, easy definition of what a smooth map of diffeological spaces is. Um, so then we make this category diff of so objects are diffeological spaces and maps are smooth functions like this. So in particular, every manifold is a diffeological space. Um, a parametrization is a plot if and only if it's a smooth map of manifolds, right? Because this is a Cartesian space. This is a manifold. So I know it classically means to be a smooth map. Um, and I just declare all smooth maps to be plots. Now, if I have a diffeological space and I have a subset of that diffeological space, then A inherits a diffeology. I'll say a parametrization on A is a plot if the composite here is a plot of X. So that means every subset of a diffeological space is a diffeological space. So that's certainly not true of smooth manifolds. Um, now, also, if X is a diffeological space and I have an equivalence relation on X, then the quotient set can be given a diffeology. So uh, a parametrization into the quotient is a plot if and only if there's some cover on my U and plots on the UI such that the following diagram commutes. So locally, I can lift the plots of this uh, diffeological space um, such that everything commutes. So that means every quotient of a diffeological space is a diffeological space. Um, if X and Y are diffeological spaces, then the set of smooth functions, uh, smooth maps inherits a diffeology. So parametrization here uh, is a plot if the adjoint map, so First of all, these are, this is just, you know, take the, the actual set adjoint, right? Um, the adjoint and set. Um, but now I have two diffeological spaces. I haven't told you what the product is, but you can imagine how that works. Um, and now, so I have two diffeological spaces and a map between them. So if this is smooth, then I say this parametrization is a plot. So that means that the mapping space uh, between any two diffeological spaces is a diffeological space. Okay, so here's a little history. Um, diffeological spaces were invented by Soryu in the 1980s uh, to deal with some interesting geometric objects coming from symplectic geometry. Um, in, so, in spirit, it goes back to Chen and maybe even further. Yes, back, but, yes so good point. I think Chen would be, definitely should be mentioned. Yes, yes, you're right. Um, several people kind of gave similar definitions uh, throughout um, the 1900s, but Soryu came up with diffeological spaces. Um, Chen had a kind of a similar definition, but instead of you know choosing cart, he had like um, convex subsets of Rn. Um, so. Uh, his so Soryu student Patrick Iglesias Moore, uh, he took the study of diffeological spaces much farther, and he wrote this really great textbook, uh, Diffeology, on the topic. Um, so, in two thousand and eight, uh, John Baez and his student Alex Hoffnung realized uh, there was a connection between sheaves uh, and diffeological spaces. So this is their theorem. Um, the category of diffeological spaces and the category of concrete sheaves on cart are equivalent. So that means that diffeological spaces are uh, precisely concrete sheaves on cart. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I'm morally obligated to say that uh, Alex was a Brooklyn College student. Oh, I didn't know that. That's yes. great. Yeah. Undergraduate. Wonderful. Um, 
So further in their paper, Baez and Hoffnung proved that the category of diffeological spaces, uh, really concrete sheaves, uh, is, is a quasi-topos. Um, so quasi-topos is very, very close to being a growth and topos. Um, but this means that these concrete sheaves, the category of diffeological spaces is complete, co-complete, and Cartesian closed. So that means it's a very good category uh, for differential geometers, at least. Um, Further, the study of how to extend geometric constructions from classic differential geometry to diffeological spaces is expanding rapidly. Um, there are definitions for bundles, tangent spaces, homotopy theory, differential forms, Dram cohomology, et cetera, for diffeological spaces. And you know, all of these constructions agree when I, when I look at manifolds, like they agree with the classical notions. Um, but when you extend them to these diffeological spaces, you actually get very interesting behavior that you don't see um, with smooth manifolds. Um, and for those interested, there's a, there's a monthly online diffeology seminar. This website has a bunch of information about diffeology. So let's take a look again at our friend axes. Um, this is a perfectly good diffeological space. You can just take R and R and as diffeological spaces, and I can just take the push out. Um, so in this paper, uh, Christensen and Wu define two kinds of tangent spaces for diffeological spaces. Uh, the internal tangent space, which is defined uh, as equivalence classes of curves, and the external tangent space which is defined as derivations on germs of functions. Um, for this space axes, both of these tangent spaces at the origin uh, are isomorphic to R2. And at every other point, they're isomorphic to R, which I think is, is quite interesting and appealing uh, geometrically. But uh, there exist diffeological spaces for which the internal and external tangent spaces disagree. Now, this isn't the case for smooth manifolds. For every smooth manifold, the internal and external tangent spaces agree. So this is now new behavior um, for diffeological spaces. So here's an example of that. So consider uh, Rn quotiented by the orthogonal group. Uh, one of the exercises in the diffeology textbook uh, proves the following. Um, this, this quotient space is diffeomorphic to the diffeological space, which is the half open interval, um, whose plots are those parametrizations that locally factor through this map which is just the norm squared. Um, so locally it factors through the norm squared. This space delta N has internal tangent space at this point zero, uh, isomorphic to uh, the trivial vector space and its external tangent space at zero is isomorphic to R. So their tangents, two different tangent spaces do not agree at the origin. Now these, these delta n spaces are actually pretty interesting uh, for another reason. Um, every diffeological space has an underlying topological space. So there's a canonical topology you can put on it. Um, and as to topological spaces, they're all homeomorphic to this interval. Um, with the classical topology, and thus uh, they're all homeomorphic to each other. But as diffeological spaces, they're not diffeomorphic to each other unless n is equal to m. And that's because of how this uh, diffeomorphism works, because here we, the norm map is coming from Rn here. Um, so, that could, so it knows the difference between delta n and delta m. However, R squared uh, divided by the orthogonal group is diffeomorphic to R squared uh, modulo the, the um, special orthogonal group as diffeological spaces. Um, diffeological spaces can distinguish quotients better than many frameworks, but it doesn't remember how many different ways two points are identified in a quotient. Um, however, there's another uh, Thing we can do, we can look at Lie groupoids. And Lie groupoids can tell the difference between these two quotients. Wait. So, 
sorry. sorry. Is there a PD theory for uh, the drawscroll space? Say that one more time. Can people solve PDEs in diffeological spaces? Um, I have not seen any work on that. Okay. So I do want to make a comment that, you know, diffeological space, diffeology is, is a very, very new subject. Uh -huh. um, and there's, there's not a lot of work done on it at all. Um, I but I, I can imagine that any anything like that, there can, you know, there's work to be done. Right, thanks. No problem. Um, so in geometry, if we have a space M and a group G acting on it, we love to take quotients. Um, they can produce all kinds of interesting spaces and we can learn more about the group G and the space M by looking at the quotient. Um, however, it's, it's rarely the case that if M and G are Lie groups and G acts on M smoothly, uh, that the quotient will be a smooth manifold. Uh, there are conditions you can put that will guarantee it, but in general, it'll not be a smooth manifold. Uh, however, as we saw before, um, it'll always be a diffeological space. But uh, there's also another more powerful way to think about quotients like this using the theory of Lie groupoids. So what is a Lie groupoid? Uh, for us category theorists, we can say a Lie groupoid is a groupoid object internal to the category man, such that the source and target maps are smooth submersions. So in English, what that means is a Lie groupoid consists of two uh, finite dimensional smooth manifolds, G1 and G0, uh, two maps um, here that are uh, submersions. Um, uh, if you don't know what a submersion is, that's just a, a map whose derivative is surjective. Um, we have a unit map, an inverse, and a composition. So we think of G0 here as the space of objects and G1 as the space of morphisms. So rather than just having sets of objects and sets of morphisms, we have manifolds. Uh, of objects and manifolds of morphisms. So every manifold is trivially a Lie groupoid. So I'll denote it like this, M underline. This is M and M where all the maps are just the identity. Um, now, if I have a smooth action of a Lie group on a smooth manifold, then I have this Lie groupoid. So what do I have? The objects are just M, the points of M, and the morphisms are um, M times G. So the way you visualize this is that points are points of M, and then M is connected to Y. Uh, a point X is connected to a point Y by a morphism if Y is equal to G times M. So the source is the projection map and the target is the, is the action of the, this action here. If you have an open cover of a manifold, we can consider this Lie groupoid, um, sometimes called the check nerve. Um, so the objects here are just points in the manifold and I label the point um, and I have a label for if it's in a UI. So I have two points X comma I, and I have a point X comma J, and these are uh, not equal points uh, in the Lie groupoid, um, but I do connect them by an isomorphism if X belongs to the intersection of UI and UJ. Um, okay, so as we saw um, the quotient M, by G might not be a smooth manifold. It might have horrible singularities, but this thing is completely smooth. Right here, we have two smooth manifolds. Um, and we still get the singular space when I do this quotient. So this notation here, pi zero of a Lie groupoid is I take the set of objects and I um, take the quotient whenever two points are isomorphic, whenever there is a a morphism that connects them. Um, so that gives me a set. Um, and in this case, pi zero of this is just the actual quotient. Does it make sense to, to talk about pi one? It does, but I, I'm not gonna talk about it right now. <laughs> it's going to give us 
interesting stuff, right? Yes. Or, yes, oh, so, oh. yes, it will. Okay. Cool. Okay. Um, so since Lie groupoids are internal groupoids to man, there's already a, a defined notion of internal functor. I'm not going to say what it is, but I, I think you can imagine what the definition should be. Um, let Lie groupoid uh, denote this category. I have a question. Yeah. When you define pi zero, in what sense uh, the answer would have changed if I forgot that I, instead of manifolds, I would have had sets. So in what way the topology on those things enter? I'm sorry? If you can go back a little bit. So let's say you have, you have one of these uh, groupoids, right? Mm -hmm. Now these are two manifolds, right? Yep. But you can also have two topological spaces. Yep. Or you can have two sets. Mm -hmm. In in your definition of, and if you have something that is built out of manifolds, you can forget and go to topological space, and even forget and you go down to sets, right? Exactly. And yeah. Your definition of pi zero is it sensitive to that? Like well, what category you're taking that quotient in is the question. What category am I taking the quotient in? Uh, good, good point. So um, let's take it to set. Okay. Um, if this was a topological groupoid, the quotient would just have the quotient topology on it. Um, but we can't take quotients in the category of smooth manifolds, so it's not going to be a smooth manifold in general. But it will be a topological space, and it'll be a set. So, but you define. So you didn't say any of that. You just said it in for manifolds. So I don't know what you meant by pi zero then. Um, so. In this case, think of pi zero as a functor from Lie groupoids to sets. Is that all right? I don't know. You, you, you can do it, but I don't know. Is that what you want to do? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, it'll always be a set. And then sometimes uh, it'll be a smooth man. There could, you could put a smooth manifold structure on it, um, but not in general. OK. It'll always be a diffeological space. It'll always be a diffeological space. The same space. underlying set. Yes, okay. exactly. That's why I to clarify. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thanks. Okay. Um, okay. So now we have the category of Lie groupoids. Um, so given a smooth manifold M and it's equipped with an open cover U, uh, we get a map of Lie groupoids. So this check nerve maps to this groupoid M um, and is just given by inclusion of the open subsets. So both of these Lie groupoids have the same quotient space. So um, they both quotient out to M, right? Because if I take a bunch of open sets and I glue them along their double intersection, um, that quotient as a set is M. And then I can give that set a smooth manifold structure of the original manifold I started with. But this, this map is not an isomorphism in this category of Lie groupoids but I want it to be, we want it to be an isomorphism. We want to think of it as an isomorphism, but it's not technically. Um, however, it is something weaker than an isomorphism. Um, so it's something called a Merida equivalence. So let me give the definition of that. Uh, a Merida equivalence of Lie groupoids is a internal functor. Um, so these are kind of technical conditions. Um, this here denotes some pullback um, and then the projection map and target map. Um, and maybe I won't exactly go through what these all mean, uh, but the point being that um, it implies that the underlying groupoids of sets uh, are equivalent. There's an equivalent, this, this implies that this is an equivalence of the underlying uh, groupoids and sets, but it's a little bit stronger than that because I'm using uh, the smooth structure also. So um, some properties of Merida equivalences is if we have a Merida equivalence, um, then this induced map on their quotients is a homeomorphism. So I'm kind of cheating here and assuming that you know I've already what I'm going to ask, yeah. <laughs> I've, I'm, I'm already assuming that you put the quotient topology on these things, right? Um, 
So, um, right, so that's a homeomorphism of topological spaces. Uh, and now this induced map here, so this denotes um, the space of maps from X to Y. Um, because uh, the maps are surjective submersions, this will, these will actually be manifolds, uh, finite dimensional smooth manifolds. So this, it makes sense to ask if this map uh, is a diffeomorphism. And when this is a Morita equivalence, this is a diffeomorphism of manifolds. Uh, and this should be X and Y. So this map is a Morita equivalence. It is not an isomorphism. Now this, this map uh, is not a Morita equivalence because the stabilizer of SO2 on the, um, the origin is SO2 and the stabilizer of O2 on the origin is O2. So these have different um, maps from the origin to itself. So therefore they cannot be, this cannot be a Morita equivalence. So I do want to think of these as separate, but I, I want to think of these as kind of the same sort of Lee group void in some weaker sense. So this Morita equivalence is, is the equivalence relation on Lee group voids that we want to use. So um, this happens a lot in category theory where we have some category, uh, we have a class of morphisms that satisfy certain properties. Um, and we want to think of these as isomorphisms, but they're not. So the question is, can we force them to be? So what does that mean? It means, um, is there another category, C omega inverse here, uh, called the category fractions that satisfies uh, this universal property? So we say the category is category of fractions if whenever I have a functor, that sends all morphisms in W to isomorphisms in D, uh, then this functor factors uniquely through this category. So that's the universal property of, of this uh, category of fractions. Um, and if you put some conditions on W, um, then this thing uh, always exists and there's a, there's a way of constructing it. Okay, so given a category, objects X and Y, and a class of morphisms, a generalized morphism, which I write in this way, the slash arrow, this is a generalized morphism, not a morphism in the category. A generalized morphism is a span here, and this left-hand arrow uh, is a map that belongs to W. Uh, an equivalence of generalized morphisms is then a commutative diagram. So I have two generalized morphisms here. And I say they're equivalent if there exists another object and uh, maps in W that make this all commute. So now we can describe what this category is. We can construct it explicitly. Um, the objects of this category are just the objects of C. And then a morphism, the set of morphisms from X to Y is uh, the set of generalized morphisms between the modulo equivalents. So morphism in this category is, a general, is, a, is an equivalence class of generalized morphisms. And then I have uh, this functor from C to its category of fractions. Um, is it a quotient category? Compose? I'm sorry? How do you compose? Um, so I should have said that uh, C needs to have pullbacks. Um, so in that case, you can, you can, you can pull back if the two spans and you pull them back and then you get a, a bigger span. Uh, to, to me, it's like homotopy theory. Um, that's, but, that's exactly what it is. <laughs> but, but in home, in classical homotopy theory, it's not necessarily a quotient space. Um, it's, it's a, it's a fraction, it's a, um, whatever, quill and model category. It's not, but I guess this is nicer. Uh, no, so you're you're right on on the mark there. If you have a model category, uh, you always have a homotopy category, and that's what this is. Um, so in that case, you would have the weak equivalences, um, and then you could uh, do this construction, and then you get the homotopy category. 
and you want to work in the model category because um, this homotopy category can be um, well in the case of model categories it'll be okay um, yeah, you have it yeah we always have this and then you have to you have to consider zigzags that are very long and then if you're if your relative category is better than just the relative category, you can try to shorten the number of zigzags. Yeah, right. But so, it's not in general. It's not a quotient category unless you have uh, start out with a very nice category. No, it's it's not a quotient category. But this is. Um, um, I don't I know don't what you mean by that. Because he has made extra. Um, he has made new morphisms. No. Uh, oh, you mean the spans as opposed to the is opposed yeah. to... right. You're not quotienting the original category. You're quotienting this gadget that's built out of these generalized uh, morphisms that are spans and composed by pullback. Okay, so just to, just to reiterate, your weak equivalences are generated by Morita equivalences. Um, so I I'm just giving a general construction now, but yes, uh, for Lie groupoids, we're going to say W is the class of Morita equivalences, and then we're going to do this construction. Mm. Well, I just, this is, yeah. I'm sorry. I know one quick question. If the groupoid is a mm -hmm. group, what 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 does the Morita equivalence uh, come down to? That is a good question. Um, you did, should or, be an isomorphism. Are, the orbits are isomorphic or something. Yeah, it should be. It should be an isomorphism of groups. Um, yeah, Morita equivalence between two groups should be an isomorphism, I think. OK, anyways, very go on. Sorry, very interesting. Emilio, okay. um, is, is this some the thing that sometimes they call it cocycles? <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, precisely. Yeah, these, so, these are so, these are cocycles. OK, so so now my next you told me if I'm not I'm just recalling what you had told me. You told me that well, you told me something that makes me think that what you're defining only is is the right thing only if you have a category of fiber and optics. Um, well, I mean, we could we could debate over what it means to be like the right thing, right? Um, because here we're not well, we're not really no, because because localization has a well-defined meaning. So you're saying look morphisms of localization can be given by very simple zigzags and isn't that only true if you have a category of fiber and objects well um in that case i'm trying to harness a homotopy type for every two objects right um but here i don't really yeah. care so much about like this thing i don't i don't care if this is a, you know defines a homotopy type no, uh, but but the, the the morphisms in general are longer zigzag, aren't they? Um, yeah. So, oh, right, right, right. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Yeah. So I'm. I said before that you have to put some conditions on W. So that those conditions are calculus of right fractions. Okay. Um, so that requires. Yeah. So yeah, you're 100 percent right. Yeah. So okay. in that case, these these will just be single zigzag. Okay. Um, so just uh, just to put it in in, in classical homo, uh, in quillen homotopy theory, if you took if you look at fibrant and cofibrant objects, then the and you can shorten it even further. It would be a single it, that, arrow. Right. Then then it's a it's a quotient category. Then the homotopy category is a quotient category, and you don't have to worry about zigzags. The homotopy category is a quotient category. When I restrict to the fibrin cofibrin objects, is that what you're saying? I think that's true. Uh, yeah, because then because then you're just taking you homotopy just have the equivalence, equivalence relation on the home sets. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, that's okay, correct. So, so what you're saying here is that the in this category things are so nice. I'm being vague. Um, it's as if they're uh, fibrin and cofibrin. No, you can't go all the way to there because you don't have a mold structure. So he's assuming less than a model structure. Right. So my understanding is this is something that works on with a lot weaker conditions, but it gives you something that's sort of less pleasant, I guess. Yes, exactly. That's exactly how you should think of it. Yeah. Um, yeah, model category is kind of the best 
you can yeah, kind of hope for a simplicial model to, cat. They're hard to come by. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, yeah, exactly. Okay. So this doesn't give you a factorization, or this doesn't presume um, some sort of factorization system that, right, is what I guess it, I'm asking. It doesn't it, presume a factorization system. He's asking, he's asking what, what axioms of a metal category are fa failed? Well, that, I, I, I'll stop asking and just let you explain. That was just me trying to <laughs> interpret what you were saying. That, yeah. Right. Um, a model category requires a ton of structure and, right, you have to choose fiber and cofibrin object, fiber and objects, cofiber and objects, you have to talk about all kinds of, of different stuff. So I'm not saying anything about that, you know, I'm just saying choose a class of morphisms and call them weak equivalences. And then if those weak equivalences um, satisfy a kind of factorization, so, so it's kind of like the these morphisms have to satisfy a factorization system, it's called a, a calculus of right fractions. It's not, uh, as far as I understand, not actually a factorization system. Uh, system. Um, then you get this explicit description of this category. Um, so this thing always exists modulo set uh, theoretic problems, um, but it's it's harder to describe if W doesn't have um, a calculus of right fractions structure on it. Uh, it doesn't satisfy uh, the conditions of being a calculus of right fractions. I don't know if that makes sense. But. Uh, okay, but we got to move forward. Let's go. We got 20, yeah. <laughs> okay. 24 more uh, slides. Go. Sorry. Okay. So, um, right. So uh, these categories have the same objects. So I just say it's the identity on objects. And then what do I send a morphism to? Well, I send it to this span. Um, okay. So then uh, I need to then map this to D. Uh, so this should be induced by this functor. Um, so I have a span like this. Well, I send it to this, right? Because W by assumption is sent to an isomorphism, so I can invert it. So then I invert this and now I have uh, a well-defined map in D. So in our case, we wanna consider elite groupoids and I wanna let W be the class of Morita equivalences. So then let this denote its category of fractions. And this, uh, these Marita equivalences have a are a calculus of right fractions. Um, so then in this category, Marita equivalences are sent to actual isomorphisms here. Um, we want to use Lie group voids to better understand quotients of spaces. Uh, for instance, the quotient of the point being acted by any group uh, as a set uh, is just a point, but point being acted on by G as a Lie groupoid is not Morita equivalent to just taking a point trivially as a Lie groupoid. So that means Lie groupoids can tell the difference between a point and a point being acted on by a group. Um, so here's some notation. Given a Lie groupoid and an object, we can consider uh, this. So these are all the morphisms from X to itself. They're all isomorphisms. Um, so this is a group. So when G is a quotient like this, um, this is precisely these, these groups here are precisely the stabilizer groups of, of the action. Um, quotient groupoid remembers the stabilizer groups of the action. It remembers how two points are glued together while the regular quotient only remembers if two points are glued together. So the groupoids help us solve problem two which is to give regular, give rigorous definitions and techniques to deal with complicated spaces and structures. So the kind of example I'm gonna provide here is orbifolds. Well, can I even say that the quotient groupoid remain, remembers the whole action? Yes, yeah. Yeah, the structure of the action is built into the Lie groupoid. Um, Okay, so what's an orbifold? Let me kind of go through this quickly. Uh, an orbifold is a topological space um, equipped with charts. Uh, so a chart is the following data. It says I have a finite group, GU, uh, and it's acting on U tilde here, which is a piece of RN, an open uh, connected subset of RN. Um, and then I have a map from U tilde to X, and it induces a homeomorphism on the quotient here into the image. Okay, so 
basically you're covered by these open subsets that have this action. Uh, so I'll, I'll explain a little bit more. But uh, orbifolds were invented by Satake in 1956, so a long time ago. He called them V-manifolds. Uh, they were renamed orbifolds by Thurston in 1992, uh, who used them extensively in his theory of three manifolds. So this is kind of the classical example of a, of a, a orbifold, it's a cone orbifold. So I take a disk, I act on it by you know, Zn, uh, and then I can quotient it by this, and that gives me a chart on this cone here. So the original definition given by Satake uh, actually had a lot of problems with it. So the definition of orbifolds and their maps uh, caused some subtle problems. So when you define everything locally on charts like this, uh, theory of orbifolds can become very technical and complex. So category theory comes to the rescue here. We can think uh, an orbifold like loosely is a topological space plus a finite group at every point. Uh, where the finite group is the stabilizer of the action uh, on that piece of Rn. So it turns out uh, the stabilizer group is actually well-defined when you switch charts. Um, so most points on this orbifold are going to be uh, given the trivial group because they're just covered by normal, uh, you know, have the stabilizer doesn't have any anything in it. Um, but those points that have non-trivial groups are called singular or cone points. So now I want to describe what an orbifold is uh, as a Lie groupoid. So we say a Lie groupoid is a tall if uh, its source and target maps are local diffeomorphisms. And we say it's proper if this map, uh, the product of S, the induced map uh, from the source and target map is a proper map, which means pre-images of compact sets are compact. Um, if a Lie groupoid is a tall, then its stabilizer groups are discrete. You know, it's a fiber of diffeomorphism. Um, if a Lie groupoid is proper, then uh, its stabilizer groups are compact. So if a Lie groupoid is a tall and proper, then its stabilizer groups are finite. So this is a good candidate for what an orbifold should be. Uh, we can call in a tall and proper Lie groupoid an orbifold groupoid. So if G is an orbifold groupoid, then I can take this quotient and this can be given the structure of a classical orbifold. Um, but there might be several different Lie groupoids such that their quotient gives the same orbifold structure. Uh, so this is where Morita equivalence comes in. Um, an orbifold structure on a topological space is a homeomorphism from the quotient of uh, an orbifold groupoid, which is an orbifold groupoid, I take its quotient, and then I get a topological space. And then if that if I have a homeomorphism to X, I say that's an orbifold structure on X. So then an orbifold is a Morita equivalence class of orbifold structures. So I have this Morita equivalence class of Lie groupoids, and any of them, when I quotient, gives this kind of classical definition of, a, of an orbifold. And then uh, generalized morphism, when I take pi zero of this diagram, I can invert it. So this map becomes invertible in topological spaces, and it gives me a unique map on topological spaces. Um, and in fact, map of orbifolds, of the underlying uh, topological spaces. So then uh, there's a fancier way of saying all of this. Uh, basically, I can say an orbifold is a differentiable stack pre presented by an orbifold groupoid. Um, so talking about stacks will actually help us understand a little bit better what an orbifold is. So um, I know I'm over time, so uh, I'll try and go through this a little bit quickly because um, I want to introduce what stacks are. So the idea of stacks, um, we can motivate it from bundle theory. So um, a bundle is a map of smooth manifolds. I want to specify a fiber. Um, so F is a smooth manifold as well. I have a map of smooth manifolds. And locally, I have, I have an open cover of B such that on every open subset here, uh, the pre-image of that open set is a product, is diffeomorphic to a product, UI times F. 
Um, so these bundles are central objects in differential geometry. They parametrize structures defined at every point of a manifold. Uh, the tangent bundle of a manifold is a fiber bundle where the fibers are all diffeomorphic to real vector spaces. So here's kind of classical uh, examples of fiber bundles. You have a cylinder and you have a Mobius strip, a Mobius band. Um, now, if you have a fiber bundle, then on each UI, you have this trivialization. But on double overlaps, you get these transition functions. And uh, this map is a map over a UIJ. So it's of this form. Um, so it doesn't do anything to the actual point X in UIJ. It just does something to the, the point in the fiber. And it depends on X and it depends on the, the intersection IJ. So it turns out this map GIJ uh, is well-defined and it's a map from UIJ to the automorphisms of F. So we call these GIJs the co-cycles of this bundle and they satisfy the co-cycle conditions. Now, if we have an isomorphism of fiber bundles over B, we get this collection of maps here from UI to out of F. We call these co-cycle maps and they satisfy this equation. Uh, it turns out that bundles are completely determined by this co-cycle data, data up to isomorphism. So um, if we let this be uh, the category whose objects are F fiber bundles and whose morphisms are isomorphisms of bundles, um, and we also let this category denote uh, the category whose objects are uh, odd F co-cycles and whose morphisms are co-cycle maps, then there's an equivalence here. Um, and there's, there's more details that go into this discussion that I should say, but I'm not going to because of time. Um, now, there's a really cool connection between bundles and Lie groupoids. So uh, letting G be the automorphisms of this fiber, we can consider this Lie groupoid. Um, so, I mean, obviously I have to say, that, you know, I have to assume that this thing's a finite dimensional smooth manifold, but let's not worry about that right now. Um, yeah, so I have this Lie groupoid, which is just G is the space of morphisms, and both maps are just unique maps to the point. Um, a co-cycle on a manifold, which is uh, equivalent to a uh, uh, fiber bundle up to isomorphism um, with respect to a cover, is equivalently a generalized map of Lie groupoids. So this is where we're seeing that generalized map uh, thing come into come into play here, because I have my manifold and I have this. Uh, Merida equivalence, and then this map is giving me exactly the data of these co-cycles. It says on every UI, I map to a point, and it's saying for every UIJ, I get a map from UIJ to G. And then having composition guarantees the co-cycle conditions hold. So a map like this is precisely the data of these co-cycles. So these are kind of the ultimate example of a structure that we can glue together from local data. Uh, but the automorphisms of bundles are also really important, especially in physics. So we won't want to remember the isomorphism. Sheaves just won't cut it because they're, they're sets. Um, we want to remember the actual uh, maps of these objects. So um, we want to consider the groupoid. So this assignment, I go from a manifold to a groupoid. It's a little weird. It's not a functor, it's a pseudo functor. So uh, let me not say fully what a pseudo functor is, other than it sends uh, every object to a groupoid, every morphism to a functor, and then to every composite like this, the composite uh, functor here is not equal to the individual composites here. It's only naturally isomorphic. And then you have to have some compatibility equations. So this gives us a category of pseudo functors, uh, this notion of pseudo natural transformation. So bun F is a pseudo functor from man op to groupoid, but the pseudo functor also interacts nicely with the site structure on man. It's what's called a stack. So a stack is a certain kind of pseudo functor and being, and the stack is precisely kind of the conditions that come up uh, when you write down, you know, what this, this bun F does, what it satisfies. So we can think of a stack as a two sheaf or a sheaf with values in groupoids. It, it's not exactly that, but it's, you know, it's a higher generalized version of a sheaf. 
And there's an important class of pseudofunctors to consider. So if I have a leak groupoid, I can consider the pseudofunctor on cart or man that takes a test space and maps it into my Lie groupoid. So now I have uh, a groupoid here where the set of points is maps to G0 um, and the set maps to G1 is a morphism. Now this won't be a stack in general, but I can always make a pseudofunctor into a stack by a process called stackification, which is a generalization of sheafification. So if I have a Lie groupoid, uh, I can consider it as a pseudofunctor and then stackify it. Now I have a stack. Um, if uh, a stack that you find in the wild is equivalent to one of this form, we call it a differentiable stack. And we say that G is a presentation um, for the differentiable stack. So let this denote the full subcategory of differentiable stacks. So ignore the two functors here. I only want to consider these as categories. Uh, this construction defines a functor of categories. Um, this two functor sends Merida equivalences to isomorphisms of stacks. So I'm, I apologize. I, I was uh, you want to think of these as categories. You can also think of them as two categories, in which case I have to change. Um, like this is this is an appropriate statement for two categories, but I want to just consider categories to make it easier. Is um, that fully faithful? This functor? Yeah. Yes, it's a, it's an, in fact an equivalence of categories. Uh, oh wait, I'm sorry. Uh, this functor is an equivalence of categories. You're asking if this one is fully faithful. Um, you can answer later. No. Yeah. Um, let me just finish and then we can talk after. Um, so I have this functor as well defined. Uh, it sends Merida equivalences to isomorphisms. So therefore it induces a functor on the localization. So, and this thing is an equivalence of categories. So we can think of differentiable stacks as Lie groupoids where isomorphic stacks correspond to Merida equivalent Lie groupoids. So we can think a stack a differentiable stack is a Merida equivalence class of Lie groupoids. So orbifolds are in particular differentiable stacks which are presented by orbifold groupoids. What about the stack bun F? Is it a differentiable stack? Yes, indeed it is. So if I have G is odd of F, then the stack of F fiber bundles on man is presented by the, the simple Lie groupoid. So that's an important theorem um in this whole subject so that's kind of the end of the technical stuff so i'm just going to talk a little bit more about where this goes so she is in stacks provide a way of expanding the scope of differential geometry and providing a new framework to describe complicated constructions that don't fit well uh, in classical differential geometry and manifolds. So where is this going? If I had more time, I'd talk about simplicial pre-sheaves and infinity stacks. So if we think of sheaves as zero stacks and we think of stacks as one stacks, then simplicial sets uh, give us a framework for infinity stacks. Um, in that framework, uh, this whole Duram complex uh, is a single infinity stack. So we don't have to think of just omega one, omega two. We can think of all of them together. So using infinity stacks, invariants and spaces are put on the same footing. So Freed Hopkins have this wonderful paper where they, they actually compute uh, the Duram complex on omega one. So we're thinking of omega one as, as, as a space in some sense. Um, so we can think of these infinity stacks as uh, coefficients for cohomology theories, and they reproduce every cohomology theory you can think of pretty much. Uh, everything kind of collapses down. Um, and you can combine and quotient them uh, however you'd like. So you can get singular cohomology, equivariant, twisted, differential cohomology, and they're all on the same footing. So I'm going to talk briefly about my research which is in progress. Um, so you can think of diffeological spaces as certain kinds of simplicial pre-sheaves on cart because they're certain kinds of sheaves. So in particular, certain kinds of simplicial pre-sheaves. Um, but simplicial pre-sheaves on cart present the infinity topos of infinity stacks on cart. So Schreiber, uh, Nikolaus, uh, Stevenson uh, show how to define principal infinity bundles in any infinity topos. So if you don't know what this means, that's perfectly fine. Um, so 
when we compare two notions of principal bundle on diffeological spaces, you have the classical diffeological notion by Patrick Calasius Samore, and then you have this notion of principal infinity bundle. Um, in an upcoming paper, which I hope to put on the archive soon, I show that these notions uh, agree. Um, however, there's a lot more technology on this infinity topo side of things. And using this bridge, I hope to port over a lot of structure. So non-abelian gerbs and connections, which are defined on this infinity topo side, I want to port it over to the diffeological side where these definitions don't really exist or are not as well developed. Okay, and that's it. So thanks for listening. Uh, oh. Hold on, I gotta breathe. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a ton, that's a ton of stuff. Holy cow. Um, this is why we record it because we you can watch the video over and over like three or four times. <laughs> so wow. Anyways, great talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Uh, uh, clapping. Wow. Um <laughs> And I want to, everyone who contributed to the chat, I mean, my God, I had to read the thing, listen to him and read your chat. Oh, my God. Anyways, thank you all for contributing, 100%. Thank you, uh, David. Okay, just before before we start with the questions, I just want to, because I get the impression that questions are going to go on for a long time, and, and they can go on as long as you want. I, I, I can't stay, but I'm going to leave the computer on. But I just want to say, next week, David, David Roberts, who's here now, is speaking, and he's going to speak about, do you have what it takes to use the diagonal argument? So, David, thank you. Thank you for agreeing to speak next week um anyways guys fire away drive him crazy ask him questions i'm going to stop the recording because it's going to go on too long but uh thank you very much